Hello everyone and welcome to Math 220A Mathematical Logic Our aim in the first part of the course is to introduce the basics of first order logic Which is often abbreviated to FOL. First order logic is the standard way to formalize mathematics. For instance, piano arithmetic or PA uh, formalizes number theory Another example is given by the so-called Cermelo Frankel set theory, which formalizes set theory. Later in the course we will see the details of these two formal theories and we'll also learn what it even means to formalize a certain given area of mathematics. To give you a bird's view idea, uh, we consider a certain formal language in which one can define the basic notions of variables, terms, and formulas. One can also define formal logical deduction rules that allow one to deduce new statements from a given set of axioms via a formal proof. All of these notions correspond to the syntactic side of formal logic, where constructions are purely symbolic and no specific interpretation or meaning is given to the symbols. So all of this is syntax. On the other hand, structures, sometimes also called first-order structures, for a given language are sets or models where it is possible to interpret terms and formulas. In particular, one can give meaning to the validity or satisfaction of a formula in a formal language with no free variables inside a given structure. All of this corresponds to the semantics of first order logic. The first fundamental result of our course will be Gödel's completeness theorem. A fundamental result in mathematical logic which states that the formula with no free variables can be formally deduced from a given set of axioms if and only if it is valid in every structure satisfying these axioms. This remarkable result shows that the syntactic and the semantic viewpoints are equivalent. It also provides an a posteriori justification for our choice of uh, syntax including the semantic rules and the formal language. Uh, in other words, it shows that there are many possible different cho choices for these formal rules, uh, but all of them ultimately give the same result. Let's begin by making all of this precise. So we begin with the discussion of languages and structures. Statements in first-order logic are just sequences of symbols describing properties of certain mathematical structures. For example, uh, we can consider the following expression for all x. x is greater than 0 implies exists y such that y times y is equal to x. Very importantly, uh, this is just uh, a sequence of symbols uh, from a given fixed finite alphabet uh, we don't impose any meaning on it uh, by a priori. However, uh, in the usual interpretation of these symbols in mathematical practice, 
that we have seen before. This is a sentence which holds uh, in an ordered field. So this sentence holds in an ordered field if and only if every positive element is a square. In particular, note that it holds in the field of real numbers equipped with the constants 0, 1, the symbols uh, for addition, multiplication, times and less than, all interpreted in the usual way we interpret uh, the separations on the real numbers, but it doesn't hold in the ordered field of rational numbers, so Q with all the same operations. Simply because if you look at the number 2, which is indeed an element of the rationals, uh, it is well known that the square root of 2 is an irrational number. And so there is no way to find a rational number so that its square is uh, equal to 2. We will see that this statement can be expressed in first-order logic. Uh, one important point, however, is that uh, some other properties of ordered fields, for example, being complete or uh, Archimedean, etc., cannot possibly be expressed in first-order logic. In order to be able to talk about all of these uh, notions and questions in a rigorous manner, we begin with the definition of a first-order language. first-order language, or just language for brevity, is a set of symbols typically denoted as L composed of two disjoint subsets. The first part will be common to all languages consists of the auxiliary symbols left bracket and right bracket together with the following so-called logical symbols. So, which include uh, the set of variables which will denote as uh, curly V and it consists of the variables uh, Vn, so just elements of the set, Vn uh, for n an arbitrary natural number. So it's a countable set of variables. It also includes the equality symbol so just a sim single symbol equals. It also contains uh, symbols for the connectives uh, for which we include the negation or not and we include uh, the conjunction symbol or and and finally uh, we have the existential quantifier which uh, is represented by the reflected symbol uh, capital letter E uh, and is read as there exists. So note that all of these are just elements of some abstract set L. Uh, there is no meaning attached to any of them. The second part of the uh, language L, called the signature,
of L, which is denoted as a sigma superscript L, consists of the so-called non-logical symbols of the language L, and this is the part which is specific to the choice of the language L. It consists of the following. First, a set of constant symbols which will denote as CL. Second, a sequence of sets F and L. So L still represents that uh, all of them correspond to the language L and N is a natural number greater or equal than 1 where the elements of the set F and L are called the enary function symbols and finally we also have a sequence of sets R and L for N a natural number greater or equal than 1 where the elements of R and L are called enary relation symbols. Or enary predicates. The language L is given by the disjoint union of these sets of symbols. Let us stress that uh, while the names of uh, the subsets of the language uh, are rather indicative and suggest some possible interpretation, at this point we are not assigning any meaning to them at all. So it's, we just have a set uh, of elements and we subdivide them into several parts uh, corresponding to all of the names uh, listed here. Let us make a couple of remarks. First, a language is always infinite. Note that the logical part of the language is in fact just countable, so the collection of all logic, logical symbols is countable. Uh, while there is no restriction on the cardinality of the set of uh, the non-logical symbols of a language, it might be larger than countable. As we already stressed, the first part, the logical uh, part, is common to all possible languages, according to our definition. So we might uh, abuse the notation slightly. And often identify the whole language L with its non-logical part, sigma L, let's give a couple of examples of languages that we will encounter later on in the course. First, uh, consider the language L empty set, 
which is not going to contain any symbols at all. So to this we refer as the empty language. Note again that here we are identifying L and sigma L. So of course uh, L empty set still contains uh, the, all the logical symbols, which are by definition included in every language, but it doesn't contain any additional non-logical symbols at all. Next, we will let L ring be the language uh, whose non-logical part consists of the symbols 0 and 1, both constant symbols, and three binary function symbols denoted as plus, minus, and times. We refer to this as the ring language. Another example is given by the language LORD, which consists of a single binary relational symbol, less than. We refer to this as the ORDER language. The next example is the language L ORDERED RINGS, which we take to be the union of the language of rings and the language of orders and referred to as the ordered ring language. We can also consider the language L set, which consists uh, of a single binary relation symbol uh, denoted by the belongs to uh, symbol. Uh, and we refer to this as the language of set theory. Uh, let's consider one more example. Let L groups denote the language consisting of a single binary uh, function symbol uh, denoted by the times operation. It also contains a single unary operation uh, denoted as the inverse operation, and it, and it contains uh, a single uh, constant one. So this is the language of groups. And uh, finally one more, uh, the language of graphs, L graphs, which consists of a single binary relational symbol E. Uh, which in the future will be used to denote the edge relation, so the language of graphs. And let's consider one more, uh, the final language. The language uh, which we denote as LR, it consists of a single constant symbol denoted by zero, a single unary function symbol, S, a binary function symbol plus, a binary function symbol times, and a binary relation symbol less than, which uh, we will refer to as the language of arithmetic. Let me stress once again that at this point all of these are just uh, arbitrary sets of symbols uh, denoted in uh, this particular way, but there is no meaning attached to them, no interpretation attached to them is attached to them. Uh, and our next definition will allow us to uh, start uh, connecting these uh, symbols with uh, the intended meaning for them. Definition. Let L be a first order language An L structure A consists of a non empty set A called the base set of the structure A together 
with an element C A in the base set A for each constant symbol C of the language L a function F subscript curly A uh, from the base set A to the power n to the base set A for each function symbol F of rt n from the language L and a subset R curly A of the nth power of A, the base set, for each relational symbol R from the language L of RT N. Given uh, such an L structure, we will write that the structure curly A consists of the underlying set A, the base set, and it consists of the symbols uh, Z capital A, where Z is a non-logical symbol of the language L. Now, the object Z subscript curly A which can be either uh, an element of the base set, a function from some power of the base set to the base set, or uh, a subset of some power, of some finite power of the base set A, uh, is called the interpretation of the symbol Z uh, in the set of all non-logical symbols uh, of the language L in the structure curly A. Let us consider some examples of structures. Example 1. Consider the structure curly N to be uh, a structure in the language of arithmetic with the base set, the set of uh, all natural numbers, the constant uh, symbol 0, interpreted as the actual number 0 in this base set, the function symbol S, the unary function symbol, interpreted as x goes to x plus 1, the, function, uh, the successor function from the base set to itself, and uh, the remaining uh, function symbols plus times uh, interpreted as the usual addition and multiplication on the set of natural numbers and finally the ordering interpreted as the usual uh, order on the natural numbers so together with all of these uh, interpretations uh, curly n is an lr ar structure a structure in the language of arithmetic defined previously Another example of an important structure uh, is uh, C, a structure which consists of a base set, the set of complex numbers. The interpretations of the constant uh, symbols by 0 and 1, the actual complex numbers 0 and 1, and plus, minus, and times, all interpreted as the usual additional addition, subtraction, and multiplication on the set of uh, on the, in the field of uh, complex numbers. Uh, so with all these interpretations, uh, C is a structure in the language uh, L ring of rings. And let's consider one more example, which we will denote as curly R. So now this is a structure in the language of ordered rings consisting of the real numbers r and 0, 1, plus, minus, times, less than, 
all interpreted uh, as the standard uh, functions, the standard operations uh, in the field of real numbers, the ordered field of real numbers, uh, which uh, with these interpretations is a structure in the language of ordered rings. Having defined L structures for an arbitrary language L, uh, we will also now define uh, the corresponding notion of isomorphism of two L structures in the same language. Generalizing the various uh, familiar notions of isomorphisms uh, from algebra, for example, isomorphisms of groups, rings, fields, etc., as well as uh, for some notions from combinatorics, such as uh, the isomorphism of graphs or hypergraphs. So we have definition. We will say uh, that two L structures A and B are isomorphic, uh, denoted symbolically as A is isomorphic to B, if there exists an isomorphism F between A and B, uh, that is a bijection F from the base set of A to the base set of the L structure B so a bijection between the base sets A of uh, curly A and uh, the base set B of the L structure curly B which commutes with the interpretations of the symbols in the uh, signature of L, in the non-logic part of L. So, uh, what do we mean by commutes? That is, First, we have that f, uh, the function capital F, applied to the interpretation of the constant symbol C in the structure A, uh, sends it to the interpretation of the same constant symbol C in the structure B. And uh, this holds for every constant symbol C among the constants of the language L. Secondly, we have that uh, the function capital F sends, uh, oh, uh, let's say, composed with the interpretation of the function symbol F in the structure A applied to a tuple A1, AN is equal to FB applied to the images of the elements of this tuple with respect to the function, uh, to the isomorphism capital F. And this equality holds for every function symbol little f of arity n in L. That's why we consider in tuples of length n uh, and every tuple a1 an so of length n in the base set of the structure a and finally 
we have that a tuple A1 through An belongs to the set given by the interpretation of R in the structure A if and only if the corresponding tuple obtained uh, by applying the, the isomorphism capital F, so the tuple F of A1 uh, through F of An belongs to Rb. The interpretation of the same relation symbol R in the structure B and we require that this holds for every predicate R of RIT N in L and every tuple A1 through AN from the base set uh, A of the structure curly A. Similarly, if a function F is not necessarily a bijection but satisfies all of these conditions, we can talk about F as a morphism from A to B. And if uh, it is an injection, we talk about uh, an embedding of a structure A into the structure B. Having defined languages and structures, let us proceed to defining some of the more complicated uh, syntactic objects that can be formed given a language, namely terms and formulas. Definition A word over a set or over an alphabet, an equivalent way to refer to this particular set, so that we're considering words over it. So a word E is just a finite string A0, A1, etc., A K minus 1 of symbols from the set E, so with AI in E for every I. Given such a word, we call K the length of the word W and we denote by uh, E star the set of all words over the given set E or the given alphabet E. Now we define the L terms uh, of a given language L. So let L be a language. Then the set TL of L terms is the smallest subset D of L star, so this collection of all words uh, in the alphabet given by the set elements of the language containing the variables of L and the constants of L and such that if we have a function symbol f of rt n from L and we have terms t1 tn in d then the term uh, given by the word f, the symbol f, followed by the word corresponding uh, to the term t1, uh, etc., followed by the word for tn, is an element of d as well. 
Here, the smallest means uh, the smallest in the, set of, in the sense of inclusion of subsets. This definition uh, gives us a recursive definition uh, for the set of terms, uh, so this is a certain particular set of words in the language L, uh, so we can uh, use this definition to represent the set as follows. So we can write TL as the union, countable union, over all natural numbers, N of T N L, where we have T zero L, uh, so we define T zero L to be the union of the constants, uh, of the constant symbols uh, of the language L and the variables of the language L, and then uh, inductively we have uh, T n plus one L equal to T n L, so all the terms that were obtained on the previous uh, step together with all terms of the form F T one T k where k is a natural number greater or equal than 1, f is a function symbol from L of R T k, and t1 through tk are all terms uh, from the previous level of the construction, so they all belong to tn L. The following proposition guarantees that term satisfy unique readability in the following sense. Any term T in a language L satisfies one and only one of the following. The first possibility is that uh, the term t is a variable. The second possibility is that t is a constant symbol. The third possibility is that there exists a unique integer n greater or equal than 1, a unique nary function symbol f. Uh, in L and a unique sequence T1 through Tn of L terms such that T is of the form F concatenation T1 etc. concatenation Tn. So any term uh, is, uh, satisfies exactly one of these uh, three options. We leave uh, the proof of this proposition as an exercise. The strategy is to prove first by induction on the length of terms that no proper initial segment of a term is a term. We introduce some notation 
in order to uh, make it easier to read expressions involving terms, from now on we shall often write f of t1 tn instead of f concatenation t1 etc. concatenation tn. Later we will see that uh, this uh, notation is suggestive and consistent with uh, how terms will be interpreted. In particular, uh, when f is binary, we might also sometimes write t1 f t2 instead of, to denote the term, uh, which uh, formally was defined as the term f, t1, t2. Uh, this is uh, in order to make things uh, more consistent with the usual mathematical notation. So, for example, uh, we can write x plus y times z. This means, uh, in the formal uh, definition of terms that we made originally, this corresponds to the term z, y, x, plus, times. Now, the height of a term t denoted as ht of t is defined as the least natural number k such that t belongs to the set t l k so it can be obtained uh, from the constants and the variables in k steps using the pre inductive procedure uh, that we described uh, earlier it then follows from the unique reading property for terms, the proposition above, that the height of the term f of t1, etc., tn, is just 1 plus the maximum height of the terms ti uh, that appear in it. This uh, simple observation will allow us to give definitions by induction uh, on the height of terms uh, in the future. Next, uh, we define L formulas. First, we define the atomic ones. An atomic L formula, and remember L is just a fixed, uh, an arbitrary fixed language. So an L formula is either a word of the form T1 is equal to T2, where T1 and T2 are L terms, or it is a word of the form R concatenated with T1, concatenated with Tn, where R is a relational symbol of R T N from L, and all of the ti are arbitrary L terms. So this defines the set of the atomic L formulas. And then we the set which we denote as FML L of 
L formulas is defined to be the smallest under inclusion subset D of L star, i.e. the set of all words in the alphabet uh, on the symbols of the language that contains all atomic formulas and such that if x is a variable of the language and phi and psi are already in D, then also the words uh, not phi, so uh, negation symbol concatenated to phi, the word bracket phi conjunction psi bracket, remember brackets are the logical symbols in the language, left and right brackets, and also the word existential quantifier x phi are all in D. This tells us that the new formulas can be formed from the old formulas uh, using one of these uh, three methods. Using this definition, we see that uh, in fact the set of all formulas fml in a given language L can be written as a union over all natural numbers n of the sets fml L subscript n where we take fml 0 to be the set of all atomic formulas define inductively the set fml l n plus 1 to be the set fml n union the following sets of formulas. So first we have all formulas of the worm not phi where uh, phi phi is an element of the set uh, obtained on the previous step fml n union all formulas of the form phi concatenation psi where phi and psi belong to fml n and union the set exists x phi uh, so that x is a variable of the language L, or just a variable, don't have to stress the language, and phi is a formula obtained on the step n. Again, the equivalence of these two uh, presentations uh, as the smallest set in the definition and as uh, this countable union uh, is not hard to see. The reason being is that uh, we explicitly required in the definition the set D to be closed under uh, these three formation rules for the formulas, adding the negation, taking the conjunction, uh, or adding an existential quantifier in front of it. Uh, and vice versa, uh, since D has to be the smallest set, it will have to contain exactly the elements in, uh, in this union. This concludes uh, the first lecture. In the next lecture, we'll discuss further properties of uh, formulas. Uh, and also, we'll begin discussing the semantics. So, everything we have discussed so far describes uh, syntactic rules, uh, just manipulations with syntax, right? So, we defined uh, languages, we defined uh, terms, and we defined uh, formulas. All of these are syntactic objects, just words, uh, just strings of symbols. Uh, from a given alphabet, given by, lang by fixing a language. And uh, in the next lecture, we'll discuss how to actually give meaning uh, or semantics to these uh, strings of symbols.
in a precise manner. Uh, thanks to everyone for listening and uh, I'll see you next time.